morning. Happy Friday. I'm so excited for Friday. It's been a long week in good old San Francisco. Um, I, I'm currently calling from the hotel room. I've been away from home in New York for two weeks, and I'm so excited to go back home, even though I love San Francisco. Um, and I am excited to talk about working in sync today. What a wonderful day to start a, uh, the weekend. What a wonderful Today to start the weekend with these three brilliant folks here. We're going to talk about unifying sales ops and marketing ops. And I am so excited to be with these awesome folks talking about this awesome topic. If you did not know, this event is hosted by the team at Modern Sales Pros. That's us, that's me. If you're not familiar, Modern Sales Pros is what we consider the world's largest revenue leadership community for those in sales management, sales and rev ops, all of the supporting disciplines. And it's our mission to create an environment for our 20,000 and constantly growing members to answer questions that they might struggle to answer on their own and see around corners they might not even know are there. We do that through great live sessions like the one you're at today. Um, we actually did our first in-person event last night, so I'm a little tired. It was a wind down. And we are going to have some more in-person events in the future, which are so fun, and I am so excited. If you love the content that you're going to see today, and I already know you will, you are absolutely going to love our content that's happening over the course of three days, April 12th through 14th for our Revenue Excellence Summit. We are getting supercharged. What does that mean? You have to register to find out. Um, there is going to be so many amazing content and speakers there. We've got revenue leaders from Drift, Mean Data, Pendo, Dialpad, Figma, Atrium, and so many more. I'm going to drop the link to the chat so you can get registered. Um, but enough about MSP. This event is sponsored by the folks at Sonar. We absolutely love them. And Brad, I'm going to pass it over to you to give us a few words about Sonar. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Well, and first off, Taylor, thank you so much for coordinating. Uh, all these events are amazing and we always have a blast doing it. But uh, yeah, greetings from Sonar HQ. I'm actually in Atlanta today, uh, not out traveling on the road, which I typically am. Uh, but for those that uh, aren't familiar with Sonar, we're a change intelligence platform. Or your go-to-market teams. So start to think of your rev ops experts, your sales ops, your marketing ops. A lot of stuff that we'll talk about today, uh, and how you orchestrate your go-to-market technology stack. Uh, it's tough. There's so much uh, software out there and competing priorities, and ultimately understanding how to harness that and orchestrate it in a meaningful way to enable and empower your go-to-market teams uh, is key for any rev ops success. And so, uh, if you're interested in learning more, let me know. I'm happy to chat about it. Absolutely. Um, well, let's meet the wonderful folks that we're that we've got with us this Friday morning. I always forget to introduce myself. I am Taylor K. Berry, uh, Community Events Team Lead here at Modern Sales Press. I'm going to drop my LinkedIn so you can connect with me, see what cool things I'm doing at MSP. Um, but Brad, I think like the, you're the three of you are the most important. So Brad, I'm going to pass it to you to introduce yourself. Oh, well, I appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, folks. Again, Brad Smith, uh, co-founder and CEO of Sonar. Uh, also the founder of uh, Wizard of Ops, an online community for RevOps professionals as well. Uh, my background almost entirely is in operations and now obviously leading a company that services the RevOps and sales ops and marketing ops world. So excited to be here. Thank you, Taylor. Deanna. Okay. I didn't know if we were going to Asia by alphabetical, but I'll go next. So um, my name is Deanna Ransom. Currently, I am the uh, president and executive director of Women in Revenue. So if you are in marketing, sales or customer success and you are a woman or identify as a woman, uh, what we do is we offer a mentorship and speaking opportunities and support and community to really continue your career trajectory. Uh, but my background has been going from customer success to sales rep to CMO. So I've kind of worked across that revenue spectrum, primarily within technology. So I spent quite a bit of time at companies such as SAP, uh, also was CMO at Televerde, and did a stint at Clarivate Analytics. So this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Amazing. You've done it all, Deanna. Last but not least, Asia. Hi, so i um, Asia. I'm the Senior Revenue Operations Manager um, at Brad, which is a fintech company. Um, like Brad, my experience is pretty much operations through and through. 
various operations roles in different industries and companies. Um, and most recently, I've fallen in love with go-to-market operations. So that's your, you know, sales, marketing, CS ops. And so this topic is also near and dear to my heart, <laughs> alignment across um, operations functions. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Amazing. I'm excited for y'all to be here too. Uh, I want to hop into some quick housekeeping notes before we dive into the content. Um, first of all, we would never let this content just float into the ether. It will live on our website forever. And of course, you will have access to the recording to share with your colleagues, to share with your best friends if they're really into this content, or you can get them hooked on this content. And the most important thing is we love for folks to be really interactive with our speakers. You have all of this amazing time with them on an early Friday morning if you're on the West Coast like I am. So please do, you know, hype them up in the chat, ask your questions. You can use the Q&A panel as well. I've already seen some folks. I see Mara in there from Houston. Hi, Mara from Houston. I see a lot of folks in there. So please do use the chat. It's very um, exciting for us when you use that. So let's get into the agenda for today. There's three things we'll be talking about. Tips for aligning your reporting for a better understanding of the buyer journey, strategies for building high converting processes like lead nurturing and lead scoring, and then last but not least, tactics for aligned data and knowledge sharing so that sales ops and marketing ops can all move towards the same goals. Woo. All right, let's get into it. So for our audience, if you were not already aware, this is actually part two in a part a four part content track series that we're doing the sonar this spring, all around redefining operations. And the goal with that content is to provide ops leaders like yourselves with a framework for success with amazing speakers like the ones you've already been introduced to today. You know, there's so many challenges that operations folks face, including alignment, staying ahead of the game, and having the strategy needed to make big changes. And last month, we talked about the alignment between rev ops and sales and today we're going to talk about the alignment between sales ops and marketing ops which is super important to sync up because it impacts so many things so let's get into it uh, we know that data is always tricky to align on and i want to start with reporting so our speakers are going to give us some tactics for aligning your reporting so you can have a better understanding of the buyer journey which is what it's all about deanna i'd love to start with you and give get your tips here yeah, absolutely. Particularly since from my chair, it was more about working across the organization, taking my Mark Ops person and really helping us to come together to create RevOps, right? Where the sweet spot is for an organization. So my tips are probably more before you create the report right before you get to that place, you know, really thinking about and sharing through discussion and defining and agreeing on the metrics that matter most. Sometimes in a functional area, uh, like marketing can be a functional area where there are metrics that are super important, you know, no one says that click through rates and open rates and such like that are not important. But when we're talking about the revenue conversation, what are the metrics that we as an, a revenue generating organization need to have in terms of understanding conversion rates, engagement rates, you know, things that are really driving a potential prospect through the funnel, right? So defining and agreeing on the metrics that matter most at every stage of the journey, super important. And then I am really big on coming together across the, the teams and having a common language. There's nothing worse than getting in a meeting and one person says a singular word, like the word lead. <laughs> and it means I see head nodding, right? I think there's nothing worse than lead. Well, it's not a real lead, right? And you're like, wait, there's only one type of lead. We agree. You have to get this common language. You mm -hmm. have to adopt that. And that's so important <clears throat> to be shared across the organization. And then what are core metrics that we can all kind of agree on should be in a dashboard that we all can look at that says this is the health of the actual revenue for the company. N no hiding 
behind, well, I've got my report and I've got my report, right? How can we kind of bring that together? So I can't wait to hear from Asia and Brad. I mean, I, this is exciting because I, I get to hear from other experts how what they're thinking too. Asia, I'd love to go to you next. I feel like you're you're all about the the common language as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, no, I I am. I agree that sometimes when we're in operations, that myself especially, I get really excited about you know doing my thing, and I forget that we have to bring all of these different teams together and say, hey, what does an SQL mean? What does a sales qualified lead? And <clears throat> In the past, I've worked in companies where marketing and finance were using two different definitions, and that has serious impacts um, across your organization because finance reports numbers up to the board, and marketing's thinking that they're you know meeting their targets and they're not. So it's really important to say, all right, let's meet on a cadence, let's meet every week, and let's review these things so that we know we're we're speaking the same language, like Deanna said. <clears throat> And then one other thing that I like to do is, and, and um, we talk about a lot is, when you map out your buyer's journey, you can create like, it can be in a, in a workflow tool, it can be in a Google sheet, it can be on paper, but add a section for your metrics. So you know, again, like Deanna said, during each stage, what are we measuring? Um, and giving that visual and sharing that visual with your stakeholders so that at, at every step of the way, you're all aligned. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm seeing the importance of transparency in that alignment too. Like Deanna, you mentioned, I've got my report, I've got my report. No, we've got to be transparent about the metrics that matter. Um, Brad, I'm going to pass to you next. Yeah, of course. Well, I, you know, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't agree with Deanna and Asia first. I think uh, if at a foundational level, you're not understanding your key metrics and having those definitions, you're, you're not going to get really far down the road at all. Mm. Uh, in, in true self-reflection of that, being in RevOps, very similar to Asia for most of my career, and then turning around and starting a company, uh, I have all people have to drink my own champagne, eat my own dog food, whatever analogy you want to use. But our team knows that. Uh, they know how, I would probably almost say, use the adjective that they want to use, how neurotic I am about key metrics and how we track them and what we all mean to them. Um, cause if you're not truly, you're not going to get very far. Um, and the world that we live in now is complex and we have more data at our fingertips and we know what to do with. Uh, and therefore we have so many different ways of measuring. Uh, I think you can put every letter in the alphabet in front of QL and it can be an MQL. It can be a PQL an SQL. I, again, I've not seen ZQL yet. So if anybody knows ZQL, <laughs> I'd love to learn that one, but there are so many ways of doing it and that's fine. Those fit your business practice. Like if you actually have a, a quantifiable way of measuring ZQL, that's great. Define it, write it down, make sure that it's shared across the whole business. Um, one thing that, you know, again, if you don't have that definition, that, that data dictionary of sorts that helps identify those, you're, you're destined to have ambiguity across reporting. And so it kind of piggybacks off of uh, what Asia and Deanna both said as well, of create the right reports, create the right dashboards, however that works for your business, and just make sure that everybody knows that those are the starting points for them. One thing at a, at a tactical level, especially in the Salesforce ecosystem, we know how easy it is for somebody to go make a copy of that report and add a new column or a new filter or anything else. That's okay. Uh, you kind of want people to be able to roll their own sleeves up and find the answers they're looking for. If they want to slice and dice that pizza a few different ways, that's fine. As long as they know the starting point, and that as a definition, as a business, here's how we look at MQLs, here's how we look at ARR, here, not how we look at expansion ARR, that's a different field, a different formula, and we can pull all that into different reports. That's totally fine. But as long as that a baseline, everybody knows that. The one other thing that I would add there, uh, and I, I say this uh, in jest to a certain degree, because I used to do this, and now again, it, it's coming back to me full, full circle, force your executives to look at those reports. Because while while we as exactly right, Deanna, while I'm sorry, yes, <laughs> I felt that. Yeah, well, well, while we, whatever business level you're at, especially if you're in an IC role, especially in sales, like you have to be metrics driven, like you're an SDR, you look at the number of calls you're making, number of emails you're sending, look at connections that you're making, all that. That's perfect. That has to go all the way up. And if the executive team and overall leaders of the business aren't looking at those key metrics, 
Um, it's totally within your right. Grab their hand, put it on the mouse, make them find it, uh, and force them to look at these and be very transparent about it because they need to know how the teams are performing. One of the ways that, that we do this, and can't really give you a full virtual tour of our office, but every department that we have has their own dashboard. Of course, that lives in Salesforce, and we share that uh, you know, virtually through all sorts of mediums. But even out there on the floors, our, our customer success team has a dashboard on a TV that anybody in the business can go and see this. And again, if you see that level of transparency in businesses, there's less questions. There's a lot of a lot less assumptions and people don't go down rabbit holes all the time. Well, what, what's our marketing team doing? What's our success team doing? Like, again, be visual, be transparent. And it reduces a lot of that friction. So force your executives to do it and put it out there for the, for the world, especially your company to see. Wow, Brent, can I just kind of chime in? I love that. It is so, it's so super important to really have that one team, one dream kind of perspective and doing that in a visual and transparent way. High fives. How do I sign up for that? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. 100%, 100%. And if, you, I mean, you know, the ch challenge, it is challenging get, trying to get executives to sit down and look, some, look at something. So you, know, you might try building it into this meeting cadence that you have, put it up, you know, the beginning of the meeting or whatever, whatever in the meeting, put it on the agenda, make time to go through it so you can start to help, you know, coax some behavior changes, because that'll take a little bit of time too. But um, all the ways that you can insert that into your, into your uh, practice is, is uh, good. It is. One of, the, one of the hardest muscles that I ever had to break, by the way, on this, and this is more in practice as RevOps than, than in my current role, was it, it inherently and inevitably in operations, you're there to solve problems. And if mm -hmm. you have the answer to a problem, you want to give that to somebody. But if that answer is very easily available for them to access... If you have to take a step back yourself. You can't jump the gun. It's like, you know what? That's a great question. I know you want to know what our current active ARR is. Do I have that answer in the back of my mind? Of course I do. Here's the yeah. link to that report. Just want to make sure you bookmark that and that you know how to find that, even if I'm not around the office or if I'm taking vacation. It's a hard thing to do because you can answer it in three words or you can really mm -hmm. educate them and lead somebody to water uh, with action a little bit differently. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Great point. Amazing. Um, I, I'm learning so much here. Um, just to recap on, on these points, you know, writing, make sure you're all on the same page. Education, that's a big one. Transparency and those metrics that matter the most. Ooh, a fire emoji. I want to see some fire <laughs> emojis in the chat for today. Um, I want to move on to the second topic here, which is um, strategies for building high converting processes like lead nurturing and lead scoring. I already know we've got all of the best knowledge on here. Um, Brad, I'm actually going to start with you first. Sure. Um, it, a lot of that kind of still converts back to what I was saying earlier, like being transparent and being visual. The, the one thing that I would also align that with as far as um, you kind of data sharing and knowledge sharing, again, dashboards are great, uh, have that high conversion, like what you're talking about. Um, the one thing that I would make sure that a lot of folks do is make sure that you're not just creating process to create process to make one person happy or feel like they get their pat on the back or like, oh, I've got my involvement. Um, I I, I promise we will not go down the rabbit hole of vanity metrics and what does that mean? And are we tracking the right thing? Don't really care about the t-shirt size of somebody in Arkansas. That's not necessarily totally bringing valuable. Is it something good that we have? Yeah, probably. Do we need to put that on a dashboard? Probably not. But understand with your business. And it, I think if you, I think if you go into a mindset, especially in a, in a high conversion process like lead scoring or lead nurturing, it is very quick and easy for you to get, down rabbit holes or to get to a place where it's like, man, we should track every single thing. Have that mindset, like take one step back of say, hey, if we're going to do this, like, does this move? What needle does this move for the business? Just ask that one question before you go build a process or even think about over indexing or over engineering it. Because if you don't, like you, you really do that. I think one of the only ways to really do that, especially cross departmental, because this is anytime you're converting something, my, my guess is it's not going to only be siloed to one group, right? Congratulations. We're talking about marketing and sales. So if we're moving one lead from to the other, um, 
you need to have that cross departmental collaboration. I can't believe how silly that says that uh, sounds saying it out loud, but one of the only ways you can do that is let somebody else get their fingerprints on it. Let them help, help them build that. People will be so much more bought into something that they help build and create uh, than anything else. Nobody likes a new process forced down them, but that is not fun. Uh, you can probably go ask any SDR or AE under the sun that if they get a new process uh, rolled out to them Monday morning at their next sales meeting, they're probably not going to like it. Um, probably because they ended up buying on it. Now they're just being voluntold what to do. Uh, get them in early. Say, hey, does this actually help you? Does this help move your needle? Does this help build the business in a better way? That's where I would say just the strategic side of it is make sure you're getting buy-in, get some other people's fingerprints on it, make sure they feel that level of success that you want for the business as well as you're building it. Amazing. I've, Brad, I feel like you're always great with the stories. Do you have an example of a time that went really well for you? Um, I have a more funny one where it's not poorly. <laughs> if that's oh, funny. I want to see. Mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> funny, <laughs> funny. yeah funny. It's satirical, right? It's great. Um, also be mindful of when you're rolling out processes. Um, I remember this was three companies ago. Um, and again, if you're doing this cross departmentally, you're trying to build something effective, be cognizant of the environment you're in. I remember uh, a very short story. I was at uh, Gather uh, when I was running operations over there. And we were just actually updating our, uh, it, was, it was part, it's two part, our sales and success handoff, but also some of our like lead process from marketing to sales. And I set up an hour for you know, essentially all of go to market. Like, we're going to knock this out. Success, you need to be mindful of what marketing's doing, sales, success, all the same thing. I want everybody in the same room. I scheduled that meeting right after our CEO announced that we're moving our seating chart around for the whole office. And so I remember sitting there presenting. I'm like, hey, this is what we're going to do. Sales team, you're doing this now. And I remember like everybody's on their phone the whole time. And they're like, dude, I can't believe I don't have a window seat anymore. Like, this is awful. I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, you got the best process in the world. You can have the best mindset and mentality. It can quickly fall on deaf ears if you're not implemented at the right time. So be mindful of your environment. That's for sure. Oh, I love Gosh. that. And I relate to it. I feel like I would also be heavily distracted. <laughs> I, I, my <laughs> I remember oh, that oh, time oh, going through seating <laughs> changes and I did get it removed for like my seat moved from a window seat to like a dark, not a dark corner, but a corner <laughs> that didn't get much light. I'm like, I used to work at a cubicle. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the days, but you're absolutely yeah. right. Be cognizant of the environment you're in and the right time. And I, I really loved what you said about um, making getting that early buy-in. Like I, I definitely would feel so much more interested in, in a process and a big rollout if I had some buy-in to that. Um, getting that input is really important. Deanna, I'm going to go to you next. I feel like you've got some, some great tips well, you know, here. I'm going to tag in on what Brad was saying, right, about getting that buy-in. And so I'll talk just briefly about like lead scoring, right? When you think about what are the touches and what's the weighting that you want to put on a model, right? And usually a lot of folks think that uh, that's a marketing thing, right? But honestly, the touch points and things inform sales of how to even have these great conversations, right? So when you're building out or even thinking about your lead scoring model, I have found it supremely helpful to have conversations and sit down with sales and with the sales leader, my, my counterpart, and say, let's take a look at this. How does the team feel about this? You know, do you agree that, you know, eh, email open is a little meh, but we want to focus a lot more on, you know, did they come through our chat? right and have a conversation? And then you want to use data. So I'm a data geek, right? So you want to use data to say, you know, benchmark what things have actually, you know, converted for us at higher rates than others in the past so that it can inform the model and you can get, again, that buy-in so that it's not marketing created a model and now the leads come in and sales says, these leads aren't qualified, right? <laughs> and then, you know, you have the two ops teams kind of looking at the reports going, oh, yeah, 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 it looked great over here, but it didn't sync over here. So getting that buy-in, super important for the entire lead life cycle, because then you want to think about, you know, retention rates or upsell, cross-sell, 
So this is where, you know, your model is not just bringing in a lead, it's taking it all the way through to close. And then what's happening after it closes? And I think that's um, a piece that many folks miss if you stay in a silo mentality. Um, coming together, you can really have a full, what I call lead life cycle type of a model and getting those fingerprints across the organization, super important, right? Because maybe you can start to find data that says, hey, when folks come in through Drift or we make sure we fire off the welcome kit within X amount of time, we see a 20% increase, right, of those folks upselling. You want to monitor that. You want to be talking about that across the team. So I think that's super important. And then not just from the scoring model perspective, um, but also in terms of like lead nurturing. To me, that's an always on type of thing. And you're constantly across the organization looking at how a nurturing approach is working who are the folks who are really responding to it? You know, sales, are these the right people? Who cares how many folks open your nurture program if it's not the right people, right? <laughs> and you will hear from your sales team if you are not sending them the right people. And customer success is just like, we. there's no success here, right? So I feel like it's super important to get that buy-in, but even more importantly, think about lead nurturing is always on, train everyone on why something was agreed upon to be a part of the scoring model. Everyone, that's not a marketing thing. That way there's this, com again, we're back to this common connection across the organization and that training, but I'm gonna say, make sure you don't do it when there's a seating change happen happening. And I'm going to ask Asia, like, you know, because I know Asia has like some amazing detailed kind of things around, you know, even better around documentation and stuff. So, I, Asia, what do you what do you have to say to that? Yeah, I am. For those who know me, very passionate about process <laughs> um, as like the foundation of operations. And so, when you think about things like a lead scoring model. Um, one is aligning it with, of course, your business objectives, but two, taking, thinking operationally, okay, how is that going to get from top of the funnel all the way to the end, right? What are the systems that are involved in lead scoring? Do we have a, a way to do lead scoring or does it need to be, you know, kind of cobbled together if we really want to do this model, right? Who needs to be updated and trained? I think so. Oh, Early on in my career, I stumbled a lot because I got really excited about rolling out these processes, and I'm like, this is going to help our team so much, and forgot to to um, take into con uh, consideration change management and training and updating people because you roll out this great model, maybe you have buy-in from um, leaders, and then you roll it out to your end users, and they never look at the lead score. And so what the, you've got a process that kind of falls apart or it's not being used and you spend all this time working on it. So when I approach process building, I think about those those components too, like not just the people layer, that's important, not just the business goal layer, but also the systems that operate, that process flow. Um, documentation helps with that, mapping out the processes, documenting your, your lead scoring model somewhere that's centralized that people can always refer back to it. Um, we're going, I've gone through a few of these exercises. We're doing it right now. We're like, okay, what are we going to include in our lead scoring model? And, um, you know, what attributes are we going to, are we going to do demographic information? Are we going to include intent information? How complex is it going to be right now? What's the minimum viable product essentially um, before we roll this out? So I think, once you once you know what processes you're going that are going to impact your business, thinking about that operational layer underneath and your systems layer is the next is the next piece. That's fire, you, Asia. Can I just say that like that is fire? Yeah, <laughs> we're dropping a lot of fire today. <laughs> yeah, Brad, Deanna, any thoughts um, on that operations piece as well? 
I, I'll just I'll, I'll double down with Asia and what Dan say as well. I, I think so much of it comes down to the sequence in which you you execute it on. And I think mm -hmm. Asia outlined that beautifully, but I think that's just so key to it. You can't rush things sometimes. You have to go at the right pace of it. But if you're not doing things in the right sequential order, it, 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 it's likely not going to work out well. But she outlined yeah. that beautifully. <laughs> yeah. And I know like some people are working in a very fast paced startup environment or you know, series A or B, and maybe you have to move fast, um, but it doesn't have to come at the expense of slowing down just a little bit so you can kind of get those ducks in a row. It doesn't mean you take a year to roll out a lead scoring model. It just means, all right, we got to get some people in the room together. We got to discuss it. Here's the, you know, the map, here's the future state and let, then let's go. But um yeah, it, it's, it can feel a little bit restrictive sometimes, process building. <laughs> um, and so I, I definitely understand that from, from the outside. Yeah. yeah, Asia and Brad nailed it. The process piece that I can think of that was very impactful uh, when we rolled some things out uh, was having a process and the right people to say who even has authorization to change certain fields yeah. within your Salesforce instance, because by changing one field, yep. <laughs> <laughs> do I need to say this? I have scar. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Bit. I don't want to trigger you. No, no, no. It's, but you're so, that's so right. You don't think about those things. Sometimes it's one field can have an impact in multiple systems. You can cause your marketing automation platform to yeah. not push thousands of leads into Salesforce, for example. No, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's something that actually happened to me, too. So I, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So y'all will, will absolutely appreciate this. And I wish I had them all. We have them all recorded. I wish I could share them all, though. I absolutely can't. Uh, it's so much of what we ask our customers. Like, we're going through our buyer journey with our customers. So much of what we fix is helping align so much of the systems talking to each other. Does that one field break something? Uh -huh. I'm not you know, I tell you this. There's times that I've had to like stop people where they've gone down their own little rabbit hole or just go in there and rant like, oh my God, Brad, you should hear this one time that somebody created this new checkbox and it triggered all these new leads and it stopped everything from coming in the thing. It's like, yeah. cool. It's like, I don't have enough fingers and toes to count the stories that we have now of that exact same thing happening. So triggering, yes. I, I think it looks for a different lens. <laughs> At least we're not alone. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I know my heart's like beating a little fast. <laughs> All right, folks, let's push to the last topic. I see a lot of fire emojis in the chat, but I would love if you had some questions for our amazing speakers here. You want to share your um, traumatizing stories of your data going all wrong you can you can use that as event session as well free therapy um but we've we've got our strategies for reporting and we've got some ways to build high converting processes let's dig into this alignment piece we've already got some like amazing gems from this so far but how do you get the aligned data that you're looking for and how you share that data and i know asia you just spoke but i'd love to start with you because i feel like you're on a roll now. Let's let's yeah. go with you. What tactics I'm do like, you have for aligning? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so we we talked a lot about definitions. That's very important, and actually documenting those definitions. I like to build something I call a data dictionary. You could call it a go-to-market glossary. Whatever you want to, however you want to label it. But essentially, it's a document that lists out the most commonly used definitions in your business. Some of them might be the same across companies like close win rate, right? That's a pretty standard one. But to Deanna's point earlier, a lead could be mean something different to you than it does in another company. So as long as you have that documented somewhere in your data dictionary that you can go back and refer to, and that you could share out so people can see it and it's visible. Uh, that's one thing you can do. And then I'm just, I'm a huge fan of getting those cross-functional meetings onto the calendar so that you can get people in the same room. I know it's hard because we're virtual or hybrid. We have a lot of meetings, but as long as you go and focus, have an agenda, this is what we're going to discuss and this is what we're going to talk about, um, that's going to help you too. Um, and it's really important, especially if, your ops teams don't sit under the same ops umbrella. 
like right now I'm on a revenue operations team, but I have been in organizations where marketing ops is not on the operations team. And so we do have to talk to them every week because what they're doing in the marketing automation platform impacts the CRM, Salesforce. We just make sure that we're aligned on those things, when updates are going to get pushed through, what information needs to come over, if there's not a singular admin for both of the tools, right? You got to actually get together to make changes. So um, those 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 are my tips there. Deanna, I feel like you're itching to go next. The, uh, the fireplace know, five, it's your it's turn. <laughs> um, but, you know, everything Asia said is a thousand percent correct. And you know, part of what was really beneficial for some of the teams that I led was, you know, really not just getting them together in a room, but we actually had a mini cadence around, if a field needs to be changed, this is the process and these are the people who actually need to improve it, right? So just making sure that you tick and tie across those teams is super important. The other thing is kind of, you know, setting at least one shared KPI, right? And the reason, <laughs> thank you. I thought that that was supremely important. And the reason is because sometimes we need to remind our teams that we are all working towards the ultimate goal of revenue as the outcome, right? And there can be and should be a pride of ownership in your work but the pride of ownership in the work has to also be connected to the collaboration that it takes in order for the team to ultimately achieve the outcome. So I'm a fan of at least a shared KPI and also not skimping on a data strategy, right? And I feel like a lot of folks recognize people and technology, and we say that these are our core resources, but your data is such a resource that it should be cared for and it should be the foundational strategy that is driving, you know, how these teams are going to work together, right? and how it's going to flow through the systems. And for me, I, you know, those are the things that I would share to say that shared KPI, not skimping on data, those are, those are key elements in making sure that you can really work towards the same goal because you share the goal. I see Brad jumping up and down like in excitement, like he's watching a football game. <laughs> I do, uh, I, like, I've got my, I've got my football over here. You need it. Um, I will say that I'm, I'm, I'm now just curious if, uh, if I know Deanna's in Atlanta with me. I'm curious if she has our, our office bugged on the, uh, the share <laughs> because, uh, it's, uh, it's so true. One thing that, that we have, especially at our leadership level, because I refuse, I've been in environments before where there's just not this collaboration between sales and marketing or marketing success or sales and product. So all of our leaders, especially when you think about um, you know, some of their variable compensation, they have a primary KPI and a secondary KPI, and both of those overlap with other people's KPI. So everybody has the top line revenue, right? Um, but we actually have uh, part of our success team sharing a goal with our product engineering team about retention, because those are hand in hand. And while both of them can't fully control that, it is something so important that they both have a shared responsibility for. You want to see people work together, let them share a KPI that drives their uh, drives their money in their wallet. They'll work together pretty quickly right. and they'll make sure they hold each other accountable. So, um, but the thing that, that I was going to kind of go with, especially from Asia's perspective, where you're talking about having that data dictionary and making sure that people know what's going on and know what's driving the business. Um, we'll take those, those same data dictionary points, the shared KPI points. I'll go back to being visual and, and sharing this with your team, whether it be on dashboards in the office, dashboards that you send out you know, through your communications with the team. So uh, two things that we do here, we talked about having the dashboards on the floor. I'll, I'll come back to a, another funny story about that. But uh, every week we, we send our weekly update out to the whole company. Um, we share those dashboards, we share those metrics with everybody. So even if you're out of office or you're, you're not here that week or you're taking vacation, you're still getting updates from the company and you still have 
your finger on the pulse and you're able to sit there and say, hey, I can click on that dashboard that the product team is using that is measuring how they're succeeding uh, or where they can use help on. So we do that. We also have, to have our, our all hands every other week that we get everybody in the whole company together uh, and review those together. What's working? What's not working? What, what can we do better on? How can we get help cross departmentally? Um, the one thing, this is actually just a conversation I was having this week about uh, maybe updating one of our dashboards that is, is out on our floor um, for our customer success team. You know, one thing that we always want to track and be very mindful of is, hey, how many number of meetings are we meeting with our, our customers on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis? How often are we communicating? Uh, and it was this kind of funny dialogue that I had with, with Aaron, our, our head of customer success. It's like, yeah, let's get those uh, that number out there. Let's make sure that we have the, the customers that we're talking to that week, because you never know when somebody in your company is walking by that dashboard and they're like, oh, you guys are talking to outreach later uh, today. I, I remember I, I helped close that deal or I was the SDR that sourced that deal. Is is Steve still there? Or, hey, I remember I'm on the engineering team. I remember this one request that, that they sent through that we fulfilled. Like, can you check with them of, of how that feature is actually working for them? Uh, you never know until you put it out there and, and allow people to come and help you. So, so often, one of the things that we kind of had to, to course correct on that. So often when you put these metrics and visuals out there, it, it can be sometimes uncomfortable. Somebody could potentially look at that like, wow, they're not, they're not meeting enough people or, or this SDR is not making enough phone calls or making enough emails. If you set the stage the right way and you're, you're hiring the right people, one that, that help embody this like team over self mentality. That's one of our core values here is making sure that, you know, you're here to help other people elevate them, bring them along like it's not to sit there and call out poor performance at all. It's actually to sit there and say, Hey, like this person might actually need some help. Like, Hey, who's that top performer that set all these meetings this week, whatever Dave Thomas in our uh, office just sets a million meetings a week, seemingly like, Hey, what's Dave doing? Like, I'm going to go shadow him for a little bit and see how I can get better as well. So it's, uh, it's so much about the visualization again, for me, I'm a very visual learner. So inherently my whole company now is very visually oriented on that side of it, but uh, it, it comes down to the root of, how can we help each other? How can we do it for the right reasons? Define those right goals, share those goals. And if you have that shared mentality, yeah, you're going to have somebody click on your dashboard or walk by and say, Ooh, that's, that's part of my, I got skin in the game on that one too. I can help there. Let me go help. So it's all about elevating each other. You know, Brett, if I can tag in, because you bring up a super important point on elevating and connecting how we can support each other doing better. Right. And, you know, I think when you have that dashboard and someone from marketing or from sales or customer success can take that click down and then they can also see, oh, wait, to your point, my SDR team was so excited to feel like they are the ones helping fuel the business and they wanted to help in any way possible. And it was encouraged that they would go back and check on things that they sourced to go back and see, how can I be of help? Right. Mm -hmm. Hey, I've got this other detail of information. Do you want me to put another call in to be of support and help get things moving? Not because it's helping their number, right. But because it's helping us achieve our shared outcome. And so, you know, you're spot on with, make sure that the purpose is clear, <laughs> right? It's to help. It is not to criticize. And, and I love that. I mean, and if you're doing that at your company, sign me up. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <absolutely>. Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I love this, this motive. I'm feeling motivated, this motivational piece of like that transparency. It's elevation and motivation. Um, it's almost, it is time for Q&A actually, but I wanted to open the floor, open the space up. If the three of you have any more questions for each other, any comments that you want to make um, before we move into our one and only Q&A question that we have so far. Cool. Oh. I was just going to comment. I think it's so funny how ops people, people are aligned with each other. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just funny uh yeah yeah so alignment yeah no we just typically no i brad says something i'm like oh my gosh that's what i was thinking how did he know that's what i was thinking <laughs> or deanna says something or you know any of the other 
awesome operations folks I'm connected with. I'm like, wow, they were saying what I was thinking or they're doing something that I'm doing. Um, Yes, yeah, so. <laughs> absolutely. We just need everyone else to be on the same exactly. level. Exactly. <laughs> pass that on to our go to market. Yes. Uh, team. And you know what's interesting, Asia, um, as you talk about the alignment piece, I start, I think I heard you say earlier, you were at a company where marketing and sales were kind of in these separate places. And, you know, you also then came to a company that viewed it as RevOps, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And, one of the things that I literally, because I was at a company that started off with the two different mark ops and sales ops and never the two did talk. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, it was like pulling teeth a little bit, not because they didn't, we didn't like to talk to each other just because they're like, well, what does that operations have to do with this operations? And hmm. there was this head down yep. functional silo yep. um, thinking that, you know, traditionally marketing did not necessarily carry a revenue number mm -hmm. and so in an old school world and i call yeah. it old school because i've been carrying a number for a long time, <laughs> right in an yeah. old school world marketing was primarily focused on lead lead sourcing mm -hmm. and such but right. increasingly as marketing owns a revenue number i have yep. owned 40 percent of the revenue for the company. Yeah. Right? Your mentality has to change yep. and it is incumbent on a leader to help their teams make that change as well. So for me, you know, I don't care if, if sales ops wasn't talking or you weren't used mm -hmm. to talking, I'm KPI and you mm -hmm. on making sure mm -hmm. that you build that bridge of communication and then I want to see it show up when we go into our meetings, yes. right? And so yes. I think that's huge and it ties back to some of the things that even Brad had shared, right, Brad? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you, uh, I'll tell you this, if you want to have a very interesting conversation, give your, uh, give your engineering leader a revenue number. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's not, people like, you feel know, like, what? They have zero control over that. Like, mm. You go spend 30 minutes talking to an engineering leader, and, and in a weird way, and, and our engineering team is very aligned to this, but they are very revenue centric. And it is such a thing that they know why we're going to build a specific feature or why we're going to go tackle this specific integration. It, it is driving revenue, and they and, and the mentality and the motivation behind that. Uh, yeah, you'll, you'll see them push very hard to get through sprints, get that revenue, like help generate that revenue. But it all comes down to that alignment, share the goals. You're, you're spot on, but uh, everything can be revenue centric. There's nobody in, uh, in my opinion, anybody's company that, that doesn't help drive revenue and growth. Yes, love it. Um, I think that is a little bit related to the question that we have in the Q&A chat. Stephanie White asked, um, how do you recommend implementing unified process for changes to CRM when one ops team only works out of email? Oh, um, Asia, you talked about, I mean, we just talked about this a little bit, how those those silos happen. Um, mm -hmm. And we've talked about the visual aspects, like with that transparency piece. Do you have any recommendations for Stephanie? Asia, I'll start with you. If not, you can throw the ball past to someone else. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that's definitely a challenge. I, um, Stephanie, I ask a follow-up question to you does your team like work out of slack or another mm -hmm. quick messaging tool um because i could see yeah it's it's difficult when i've been in organizations where there it's heavily slack focused and maybe a few people are in email and vice versa and especially early on when slack wasn't really as big of a thing so mm -hmm. my advice is to act a little bit like a product team here and establish you know, like Brad mentioned sprints. So have a, a document could be a Google sheet. If, if you don't have budget for a PM, a project management tool somewhere where you can have a list of all the requests that come in, identify which system they need to go in, you know, a, a short, like, why do we need to do this? And you got to meet with these people on a K like every week. So you can go through that list and prioritize what changes need to be made because it's going to be very hard if you can only communicate with them through email and uh, then just establish that process. Like every Monday, we're going to go through this backlog of requests. We're going to approve some and we're going to, you know, 
or um, prioritize, and then we'll make the changes, and then every agree on a time to push the changes, because uh, the best practice is to not build in production, like I have done early on in my career, and now I'm trying not to do. Right? It's it's you don't want to ever make changes in your live CRM instance, but having a process to go through and say, all right, here's the changes we're gonna make. They're gonna be in the sandbox, and every Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific will push them into production. And then you can update your teams the following Monday and say, hey, we made this change over the weekend. Uh, hope that helps. That, that would be my my tip. But curious what Brad and Deanna have up their yeah. sleeve. Deanna, Brad, I'll, you. I'll follow oh, up after you. <laughs> you know, it, because that became a thing um, for when we were kind of moving forward, what we did was we set up a simple form on a smart sheet that literally pinged, you know, the admins of all of the systems and it kept a log of all of the different requests that were coming in. And then that team had a biweekly cadence, that team being the cross-functional owners of the systems that pinged to come together, review them, you know, prioritize, you know, which ones are the ones that we literally need to make, you know, and okay, report back to the requester the time frame of when that change could or would be made, or if they needed more information or to connect. And we just tried to make it, you know, easy and accessible, but alert all of the folks. So we weren't worrying about, to Asia's point, are they in Teams? Are they in Slack? <laughs> Are they in email? You know, mm -hmm. hey, you're going to get a ping, right? No matter what channel you're using. And there's already a cadence for coming together to work through these requests. Yeah, that's a good point. I love that request um, form idea because it it helps you bring everything and centralize it too with less manual, a little less manual work. Um, I think this is a <laughs> this kind of pain is a is a good uh, case to centralize operations teams. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. <laughs> Preach. I'm, I'm right there with you. you know that. Um, just, I mean, like that's that's a very clear case right there. How do you get marketing automation platform to talk to Salesforce? If you want to make a change, you got to go through additional what feels like hoops to make the change when, if it's on a centralized team, say revenue operations or go-to-market operations, you, know, you understand all the, how all the systems are connected, or there's someone on your team that eliminates a like yep. a bottleneck. I, I completely agree. No, I was going to say the, uh, the advil to your headache might not necessarily be in the process itself. It might be in the methodology you're deploying, which is if you have your operations teams in silos, uh, this, it was, boy, this is a great time to unify that part of it. Uh, the thing that, right when I read that question, the first thing that I, I just gravitated towards was like, you're operating only out of email. Well, that's, and that's fair. I think a, a heavy amount of communication, I can look at my inbox as the number just continues to go up over the last hour. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not going anywhere. That is one of our, I would say, our foundational means of, mediums of communication, right? Um, but my guess is, you're not all robots yet, and you probably are spending some time virtually or in person together collaborating meeting on that. Um, I think this is probably more of a, a symptom or a, a, a factor of how you collaborate, how you communicate. Um, if you're having trouble getting that unified process rolled out, the, the two ways that I've, this is just kind of foundational to life. There's two ways to get people to do things. You can either positively motivate them or negatively reinforce them. Uh, pick positive motivation nine times out of nine. You, know, you, you very rarely want to lean back on negative reinforcement. You don't want to have punitive damages for anybody if they don't do process the way that you need it. Mm -hmm. But I would really gravitate towards figuring out if you're breaking down in your communications and, and your process that you're building, somebody's not positively motivated to, to participate. Somebody's really not, they don't have enough skin in the game. They don't have that buy-in. Go back to the shared goals like Deanna was talking about. Like make sure that they have some skin in the game to get that part of it done. Uh, and if they don't, you can help still provide that. Like if you're across operations teams right now and you're having a really hard time getting somebody to like, hey, I need that unified process. I need your part of it. If they own a piece of it, 
it's perfectly fine to be vocal with them. Like, hey, team, if I'm on the sales side, in this example, and, and I'm working with a marketing team and, and the marketing operations person's not getting their stuff done, like it's perfectly fine in a, in a, in a bigger, open, uh, positive voice. Like, hey, we're trying to update that uh, that sales to success handoff part, or that's sorry, that lead to, uh, you know, the marketing to lead part, but you're, we can't do this without your participation and you doing your portion of it. So we're kind of bottlenecked here and we want to get this process out by the end of next week. But if, if we can't get your sign off on it, we just can't go live with it. Um, and that's just really fact of the matter. If you don't have everybody's buy-in, you don't have everybody's consensus, you shouldn't rule that process out, but let them know that, Hey, you're, you're kind of holding this process up. And that's totally fine. Be respectful about it. Be positive about it. But, let them know that business needs to move forward. We got goals to go hit, and this is directly tied to it. Let's work together. Let's get it done. Let's be unified. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what a way to end this. Let's be unified. That's what this is all about. Um, Stephanie, thank you so much for your question. Drop the drop the mic. We're, we just. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just wanted to move quickly. I know we only have five minutes together and, and grab our key takeaways here. If you had to tweet out something, the most important lesson you wanted folks to learn here, there's so many, as so you can only pick one, what would it be? Um, let's start with Deanna. Wow, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know, I know this has been supremely about, you know, unifying and there's been a lot of tips, but, you know, if there was one thing to take away from this for me, um, from my chair, it's remember you are one team, one dream, mm. right? Work together as such. I love it. That's I want so to hear a song about that. It's so That's tweetable. A hashtag but and everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> That's agree. awesome. Yeah. Um, Asia? I agree. But, oh my gosh, it's so hard to follow that. It's so succinct <laughs> and so we true. Put it lot. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we're remembering that you're working towards the same goals. This is very important. And being that we're in operations, we're that glue. We're connecting all these people together to get on the same page. Right. Mm -hmm. So having a, a shared document with all of your definitions, having a cadence for to review reporting and um, metrics and the process is the key too. So those three things would be my my key takeaways. Love it. Love it. Brad, yeah. last but not least, let's get your tweet. <laughs> you're, you're, you're just setting me up for failure, asking a guy who's very long to keep it to 140 pounds would not go well. Uh, but if I did have to air quote it into, into something tweetable, um, be transparent and Assume good intentions. I think that's 140. Mm, that's a good so one. There's well, and here's the biggest reason why we talk about unification. We talk about collaboration and, and really working there. So often in business and just in life, there's friction. We get it. Everybody's stressed out. Everybody's got KPIs to hit. Everybody's got goals to go hit. But when somebody's truly trying to collaborate with you, they're not doing it with malice or ill intent. They are truly assuming you should always go into that conversation assuming good intention that the person who's making that request of you is to move the needle forward, have a very optimistic view of it. But just, it, we say, we, it's part of our uh, core principles here. It's like, assume good intentions. Like, and it's, if you kind of operate in that mentality, you're gonna do yourself and your team a lot of favors in how you get unified and collaborate. That's good. Hey, love it. If you don't think we're redefining operations in this series, oh man, I don't know what to tell you. We just <laughs> redefined ops so hard. Um, we are going to have our next session for this, our third content track next April. So I just popped the, the uh, link in the chat if you want to click that and get signed up. There's no way you're going to miss out on as amazing content as this, but I want to give you, uh, give a huge thank you to Deanna, to Asia, to Brad for dropping this knowledge on a Friday morning, to everyone who attended. Uh, this is early for me. I know it's nine and we start work at nine, but like I'm so <laughs> sleepy and I feel so energized by this conversation and I feel so excited and thankful that um, we could have all of your time today. And of course, thank you to Sonar for sponsoring. I hope you have a wonderful wonderful weekend, a happy Friday, and see y'all at the next event. Right. Bye. Thanks Bye. for everybody. Take care.